Hey, you! Yeah, you! Have you ever heard of cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPET? Well, today is your lucky day. We are going to show you. What is CPET, you ask? Well, CPET is this new method we have of assessing how well your heart and lung or cardiopulmonary system is doing. It will let us see how well those systems work together, not just isolated systems. Why? It can be used to differentiate between cardiac and pulmonary reasons for shortness of breath and exercise limitations. It is used to help predict mortality in patients of heart failure, especially in patients who are potential transplant candidates. CPEC can also be used to evaluate the effect of how useful some therapeutic interventions are for reducing your symptoms. Most importantly, because this is done during exercise, it keeps us a better picture of your functional status. How? Well, we hook you up to big fancy machines that will help monitor how much oxygen you are using and how much carbon dioxide you are expelling. To power your body, your muscle uses oxygen as a fuel and the waste product is carbon dioxide. This is called aerobic metabolism and it occurs when there's enough oxygen to fuel the muscles. To understand CPET, you have to understand Fick's equation. VO2 is oxygen uptake, SV is stroke volume, HR is your heart rate. This together is your cardiac output. C oh, not here! To the CPET lab we go! Now let's get you more comfortable. Before we start, we need to check a few things, such as basic labs, including hemoglobin, creatinine, EKG, and pulmonary function testing, including maximum voluntary ventilation. And some patients may also require a chest x-ray and ABG. There are a few absolute contraindications. Recent MI or PE, unstable angina, cardiac arrhythmia, severe aortic stenosis, dissecting aorta, peri or myocarditis, or congestive heart failure or asthma exacerbation. There are also a few relative contraindications, including systemic hypertension, resting tachycardia, ventricular or atrial ectopy, moderate aortic stenosis, severe valvular diseases, severe electrolyte imbalances, uncontrolled diabetes, orthopedic or neuromuscular diseases, advanced or complicated cardiomyopathies. Do any of these apply to you? Now the CPET is either performed on a cycle ergometer or treadmill. Each has their pros and cons, but we will be using the exercise bike. Hop on! Hold on there, sport. We're not quite ready yet. Let's first adjust everything so that it is correct for you. CPET has different levels. They all involve a mask for breath-by-breath -breath analysis. Some require an arterial line and sometimes central venous axis. But today, we don't need any of this. Before we start pedaling, let's just get everything attached and take a few readings as our baseline. Before we start, do you have any questions? This is called the rest phase. It takes about two minutes. It helps you get adjusted to all the equipment. Now you can start pedaling. Cool sport, not so fast. If you want to start off so vigorously, now let's just try to maintain 60 revolutions per minute. We will control the resistance. That's not too bad, right? It will help your body get adjusted to all the equipment. Right now, you are in the unloaded cycling phase and there is no resistance. There are several protocols for increasing intensity in CPET. We will be using the RAMP protocol, where we smoothly increase intensity of exercise. We may also have to stop the test prematurely for several reasons, including increasing ectopic beats, changes in EKG morphology such as ventricular tachycardia, ST segment changes, hypotension, or oxygen desaturation. Even though you are exercising, your oxygen saturation should still be greater than 90. Things that may cause desaturation are impaired diffusion, V-cube mismatch, or a right-to-left shunt. Now remember, that CPET mask you should be wearing monitors your O2 and CO2 content breath by breath. We know at sea level, oxygen makes up 21% of inspired air. By measuring the oxygen saturation of expired air, it will allow us to calculate how much oxygen was consumed by your body. Similarly, we know that the CO2 content of air is negligible, or 0%. By measuring your CO2 of exhaled air, we can calculate your VCO2. Looks like you're all tired and ready to stop. Now your results look pretty good. Good job, sport. Until next you time, you can sit right there and rest. This is called the recovery phase. 
One of the most important and measured data from CPED is a VO2 max. Like we've mentioned before, this is a good estimation of your fitness level. We can calculate an expected VO2 and see how well you compare. There are several formulas for calculating expected VO2 based on your gender, age, and resting heartbeat. The VO2 will be affected by everything in your cardiopulmonary system as well as muscles. VO2 max can be low due to heart or lung disease or just being un. The next thing we look at is the heart rate. We can estimate the maximal heart rate with another formula, 220 minus age. Just like for VO2, our goal is to reach 80% of estimated maximal heart rate. The heart rate is usually the limiting factor for exercise capacity. People that reach 80% of their predicted maximal heart rate during exercise or even at rest are said to have low reserve and may indicate poor cardiac function as they rely on their heart rate to maintain cardiac output. People that are unable to reach 80% have a high reserve and indicates that a non-cardiac, such as a pulmonary or peripheral vascular reason for having poor exercise function. Oxygen pulse is how much oxygen is used per heartbeat and is calculated by dividing the VO2 by the heart rate. Just like before, we can calculate a maximum O2 pulse by taking predicted VO2 max and dividing it by maximum estimated heart rate. O2 pulse is a surrogate for stroke volume, therefore a low pulse O2 may indicate cardiac disease. The goal as before is to reach 80% of maximum predicted. Plateauing may indicate myocardial ischemia and failure of O2 pulse to rise may indicate poor left ventricular function. Meniventilation is the amount of air inhaled and exhaled in one minute. The formula for estimated maximum minute ventilation is 20 times FEV1 plus 1. Our goal is to reach 80% of your maximum minute ventilation. Reaching greater than 80% is called low reserve and indicates a respiratory dysfunction. Not being able to reach 80% indicates a possible cardiac limitation to your exercise capacity. As we can see here, the increase in minute ventilation is initially due to rate and tidal volume. As testing progresses, tidal volume doesn't increase very much and increases in minute ventilation are because of rate. If there's no increase or failure of tidal volume to rise, then a lung disease is suspected. We mentioned that before that energy is generated by aerobic metabolism produced by the cells when oxygen is abundant. During periods of exercise when you can no longer supply enough oxygen to your muscles, additional energy is generated by anaerobic metabolism producing lactic acid as a byproduct. This lactic acid is buffered by bicarb found in the blood. The chemical reaction generates water and carbon dioxide. Eventually, there's too much lactate to buffer and the acid builds up in the blood causing acidemia. Your body will attempt to get rid of this acid by blowing it off as CO2. The point at which this acid buildup increases ventilation is called the respiratory compensation point. Reaching this point is a good indicator of exercise effort and lung quality as it is able to increase ventilation further when needed. Next, let's look at the respiratory exchange ratio, which is the ratio of VCO2 to VO2. Initially, we expect the value to be less than 1, as some of the produced CO2 will remain dissolved in the blood as bicarb and not exhaled. Anaerobic threshold is a point at which the respiratory exchange ratio goes from less than 1 to greater than 1. This usually occurs at 40% of predicted VO2 max. When we plot both VO2 and VCO2 versus time, anaerobic threshold is when the VCO2 crosses the VO2. Next, let's talk about ventilatory equivalents. The VEQO2 is a minute ventilation per VO2 and represents lung efficiency. In other words, it's how much air you need to move in and out per oxygen used. The lower the number, the better, as lung disease will reduce lung efficiency. As you exercise, you recruit more alveoli, reducing shunt, and increase perfusion, reducing dead space. Therefore, at some point, you will have the maximum number of alveoli recruited and perfused. At the nadir is your anaerobic threshold. After the respiratory compensation point, your ventilatory equivalent of oxygen increases not because it becomes less efficient, but because your oxygenation cannot increase, but your ventilation does. At the nadir of your VEQCO2, you have the respiratory compensation point. The time between the anaerobic threshold and the respiratory compensation point is your isocapnic buffering. Initially, you will see a decrease in anti-O2 as more oxygen is being used, but after the anaerobic threshold, you will see an increase as ventilation increases without more oxygen being absorbed. Similarly, with entitled CO2, you will initially see an increase in CO2 exhaled, 
but at the respiratory composition point, due to increased ventilation, you will see a drop in entire CO2. So let's review. VO2 is a measure of your exercise capacity. Heart rate being too high indicates low cardiac output. Low means a pulmonary limitation. O2 pulse is a surrogate for your cardiac output. Minute ventilation is how much air is moved in and out in one minute. Ventilatory equivalent is how much air is moved per oxygen and CO2 used. Now your results look pretty good. Good job, sport.